Hello everybody, welcome to the Voice of Faith and welcome to part 10 in this series, The Household of Faith, Having Your Bibles. Let's open them please to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. This is part 10 in The Household of Faith, but it's by faith part 3. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. I'll give you a moment to get there and write down. I know you're going to begin taking notes. The Lord is good, isn't he? Yeah. Hallelujah. What a word from God. Hallelujah. I should have recorded that, shouldn't have I? Thank you, Lord. I should have just hit the recorder and recorded all that. Hallelujah. We'll do that next time. I'll know better. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. But one thing we know for sure, we're closer than we think. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hebrews 11, 1 and 2. Now, faith is the substance of of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. You cannot bring healing to your body by confessing a definition. You cannot bring financial supply by confessing a definition. Let me give you an example. We have a brother comes in and he's sick and he comes up and he says, we need, I need prayer, got this thing going on and I need prayer. And so we all gather around him and we're going to lay hands on him. We're going to anoint him with oil and pray. And he goes, wait, wait. He goes, before you pray for me, he said, I want to say something. We go, all right. He says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Just because you know the definition of faith will not bring you results. It's an important that we know what faith is. And this is the definition of faith, but declaring a definition will not give you the results. You've got to go beyond the definition and find out how to apply the definition. And that's what verse 2 on for the rest of the chapter and in the chapter 12 talks about. It is how to apply the definition of faith. And so we're looking at by faith, we're looking at how to live by faith. Verse 2 says, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Our elders obtained a good report and they did it by faith. We have been given an opportunity to obtain a good report. And like those that have gone before us, it will be done by faith. And we've seen in this series how important it is and how wonderful it is to obtain a good report, right? Yes. Hebrews 10, 38. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Four times the scriptures tell us, now the just shall live by faith. We are to live by faith. We're the household of faith. And we're looking at this phrase, by faith. What does it mean? When someone says, I'm going to live by faith, what does that mean? I don't know what they mean, but we're looking at what the Bible means when it tells us to live by faith. And we're looking at how important this two-word phrase is. We are to live by faith. And we've made this statement several times. Faith is not a one-time event. Faith is a lifestyle. It is a way of living, and I love this, faith is a process that we do over and over and over and over again. And so that process that we do continuously becomes a way of living for us until we get manifestation, then we go on to the next thing. And then we learn to live this way, and we're looking at the different components of, or the elements, however you want to say it, components or elements of living by faith. Let's quickly go over what we've already looked at. Number one, a quality decision. If we're going to live by faith, it's going to be by a quality decision. How many of you remember, um, sorry about that, uh, how many of you remember that we, we talked about in Joel 3, Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. The day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. 
And we talked about how we're not waiting on God. God is waiting on us to make a decision. And then when we make that decision, then the power of God is there to back up the decision we make. So the first thing we have to do is we have to make a quality decision. I'm going to be a person of faith. I'm going to live by faith. And then number two, we talked about find your receipt. Find your receipt. Find those promises that cover your area. And we talked about how a receipt is proof of purchase. And how we need to find those things that belong to us in the Word of God. And the way you do that is by finding the past tense verses in the New Testament. And we use the classic example of 1 Peter 2.24. By his stripes ye were healed. That's, that's your receipt for your healing. Jesus has purchased your healing. He's already given it to you. Now it's up to us to take it, to receive it. Kind of like this. Uh, remember the layaway? Remember the stores that had layaway? All right, well, Jesus has your healing in layaway. It's paid for, it's been given, but you've got to take your receipt and go up to the counter and take what is rightfully yours. So we got to find the receipt. Number three, hear the word. Hear the word. The Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing, not by having heard. So we have to continually hear the word of God. And we talked about how we need to hear what we've already heard. Especially those things that God has spoken to you, you need to keep going over those verses again and again to keep the reality of them strong and fresh in your heart. Hallelujah. Right now, I've got the bobblehead ministry. I've got more bobbleheads than amens. But we're going to get to the new stuff where you can get excited. So it's all right. I just wish people could, could, could see the video. All they got is audio. So I want them to know you're doing a good job. All right. Number four, meditate the word. Number four is meditate the word. And we talked about why meditation is so important. And we talked about the, the big deal with meditation is that we've all experienced contamination of the imagination. And it's through meditation that we experience sanctification of the imagination. Right? right. And that probably the number one reason why the word doesn't work for people is because of a... Because of wrong inner images. Because of contamination of the imagination. It's not enough just to make a good confession if on the inside you, have, uh, you have, uh, have obtained and you are entertaining imaginations or pictures, inner images of you failing, of it not working for you. So we've got to meditate. And then number five, we went on to confession. And we talked about how you've got to confess the word, but we should never split up meditation from confession. And we looked at Psalm 19, I think it was Psalm 19, that says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. How many of you remember that verse? Yeah. And we talked about how those two go together. It's not, you know, if all you do is say a, good, say a good word, but you're meditating on unbelief, it's like firing a gun that has blanks in it. There's no bullets, there's no substance. Yeah. So we're just kind of reviewing here, getting us in the flow. And some people weren't here, so I want them to catch up with this. They can get the the CDs or listen to it online. Number six, we talked about acting on the word. Acting on the word. You're not ready to act on the word till you've made a quality decision, till you found your receipt, till you hear the word, till you meditate the word, you confess the word, and now it's time to act on the word. And we talked about how in acting on the word, this is, a, this is crucial that we know how to be led by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit will lead you step by step on how to act on the Word. And we also talked about how the first, the first four of these, you're really getting the Word, you're getting faith, but then verse 5 on, confession, acting on the Word, and the rest, is the releasing of your faith. I, I, need, to, I need to say this. Meditation is confessing to your faith and to your spirit. But then the profession of your faith is the releasing of the faith you built up. And I remember one time so distinctly, I had my Bible, I was meditating, and the devil began to mess with me, and I just said out loud, I'm not talking to you. I'm not talking to you, I'm not dealing with you, I'm talking to me, I'm dealing with me. I'll deal with you after I get me straightened out. Right? Because, right? you know, you just get in that flesh deal with him and he's one you got to stay in faith 
So you've got to act on the word. And we talked about how to be led by the spirit. And that's so important in acting on the word. The number seven, we talked about apply the pressure of patience. Apply the pressure of patience. And we mentioned last week that patience is not, it doesn't mean to put up with. Patience means to be consistent, to be constant. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's patience. And we, we saw how it's through faith and patience we inherit the promises. It's not just through faith. Not everything is going to be instant. That's why it's a way of living. And patience helps us to stay in faith until we get the desired result. So we have a quality decision. Find your receipt. Hear the word. Meditate the word. Confession. Acting on the word. And then apply the pressure of patience. So let's continue and complete today this message on by faith and what does it mean to live by faith? How do we live by faith? Well, we do these things here and then we move on today to number eight and number nine. Number eight is this, for those of you taking notes, number eight is understanding due season. Understanding due season. Now we did a series sometime back on times and seasons and I'm going to give you some new information today about times and seasons. And it may want to spur you to go back and re-listen re to that series or go over to our sister's house on Tuesday night and get the, get the series all over again from her. But I have some new information about this area that I've never given before. Let's go to Ecclesiastes 3, please. Ecclesiastes 3 and 1. We need to understand due season. This is an area that the enemy uses to bring discouragement. After you've, you've made your decision, you've found your receipt, you're hearing the word, you're meditating the word, you're confessing the word, you're doing the word, and you're trying to stay patient, and then the devil comes along and he says, it's not working. Have you ever heard that besides me? It's just not working. And so because of uh, well, here's how my man of God, our man of God says it. Time, tr time tries trust. Time tries trust. The passage of time tries your trust. The devil will get you to look at your watch, look at the, look at, uh, the calendar, look at how many days or months have gone by, and there's still no manifestation. And because we don't understand due season, we can, we can be tempted to grow weary and faint. And so we need to understand due season. Ecclesiastes 3.1. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. Now, when I first read that many years ago as a teen, or maybe even a preteen, I remember looking at that verse and I just didn't like it. And I had a hard time, you know, because I'm like, well, Lord, I want it right now. Yesterday would have been better, but I want it right now. And it's like, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. Come here, Lord. <clears throat> come here. Could we erase this? Could you kind of like come down supernaturally and change this verse and put in there that, that now is the season for everything? Come here, come here. Let's, let's talk about this verse. I'm not liking this. But actually, as I've grown and matured, I've come to see that this is a wonderful verse. It's a very encouraging verse. To everything, say everything. everything. There, is there is a season and a time, and a time. To, every to every purpose under the heaven. With God, there is an appointed time and a due season. There is an appointed time and a due season for everything. This is a most in, uh, important truth to grasp. God has an established season of time for every purpose in your life. Now, I'm going to go over this slow, and I'm going to ask you to write that down, please, because this is going to be an encouragement to you. God has an established season of time God has an established season of time for every purpose in your life. Season of time. Not just a, a moment 
where you get 30 seconds of enjoyment and then it's over with. <laughs> you know, the summer season doesn't last for a day. It lasts for months. All of the four seasons in where we live, you know, they last for months. Well, what God has for you, there is a season of time. There's a verse I found that I really like that says that my people shall long, and long enjoy the work of their hands. Now, I believe that that verse is true of this life. It's true of the millennial reign and all of eternity. You and I are going to enjoy the work of our hands, the fruit of what we're doing now. You and I are going to be rewarded and enjoy the fruit of it for a long time to come. That's a good word. Hallelujah. God has, established, uh, God has an established season of time for every purpose in your life. God has ordered seasons for all things to take place. God has ordered seasons for all things to take place. God has ordered seasons for all things to take place. How many of you remember when we talked, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, that part of obtaining a good report means that you kept pace with what God was doing in your life. Do you remember us talking about that? You know, if you keep pace with what God's doing, and we use the illustration of a newspaper being delivered to your door every day. If we keep pace with what God's doing in our life, we're going to wind up with a good report. Now, here's the deal. This is where keeping pace with what God is doing in your life comes into play in a big way is because you're understanding seasons. If you understand this season that you are in spiritually, you can keep pace with what God's doing. But if you don't discern the season or the time, then you can't keep pace with him. Does that make sense? You see what I'm saying there? If you're going to keep pace with what God's doing, you must understand the season that you're in. There is a season, there is a time. Please say that with me. There is a season, there is a time. One more time. There is a season, there is a time. That, is, that should encourage you. Because the devil will tell you it's not happening and it will never happen because if it was going to happen, it would have happened already. That's what he, he tells us, right? But he's a liar. So there is a season and there is a time. And if you're not in this season that you want to be, I have got great news for you. You are one day closer than you were yesterday. And the devil is just so after you to quit, to throw in the towel, because he sees that every day you're making progress. There is a season. Come on, there is a season. There is a time. God created seasons. This is new. I love this. God created seasons to get you ready. God created seasons to get you ready. Holy Spirit, write that upon the tablet of their heart. God created seasons to get you ready. He's always ready. <laughs> A perfect God does not need to get ready. Every season and at all times, your faith is required. I'm going to ask you to write that one down. That's very important. Every season... And at all times, your faith is required. God created seasons to get you ready. Every season and at all times, your faith is required. That's how you keep pace with what God's doing in your life. You understand your season and you keep your faith engaged. So keep your faith engaged in this season that you find yourself in. But Brother Phil, I don't like this season I'm in. I understand that. I understand that. But you've got to keep your faith engaged. Because God is using this season to get you ready for, for the next season. And, and believe me, you don't, want to get, uh, you don't want to disengage your faith in this season. And when the next season comes, you're not ready spiritually. You want to be as spiritually mature as you can be when you enter into your next season. And that requires you keeping your faith going. Hallelujah. Don't miss this season of your life longing for the next season. 
<laughs> oh, I've been so guilty of that. Don't miss, don't miss this season of your life <laughs> longing for the next season. Don't miss this season of your life longing for the next season. Anybody been guilty of that besides me? Oh, if I could just get these kids raised and out of the house. How old are they? <laughs> Two and four? you got a long season ahead of you. Oh, if I, oh I just can't wait till I retire. Then I'm going to really enjoy life. How long have you been there? Three years. <laughs> Boy, when I turn 65, my life will begin, but I'm 27 now. Right? A little bit of an exaggeration, but you know what I'm talking about. And God has something for you in this season. He has a revelation for you now. He has, he has intimacies with you that he desires now. And if you will keep your faith engaged in this season, it will prepare you for the next one. And it's, it's a cycle. But it's a cycle that doesn't go down. It just goes up. And as, as our granddaughter says, it's up and up and up. She always says, up and up and up three times. <laughs> Right? So, so this, this season, this cycle of season with God is up and up and up. We go from glory to glory. And so every season, God is preparing you for what's coming in the next, and he just takes us right on up. Hallelujah. So, so don't miss out on what God has for you during this season. Now, this is a one-liner God gave me uh, that really fits in with patience from last week. Keeping faith active while waiting for due season is patience. Keeping faith active while waiting for due season is patience. I got to, whenever I teach on patience, I don't know why I keep being drawn to this little statement. You're in a long line at the grocery store, and you're going to wait. You've got a choice. You can either wait patiently, or you can wait impatiently, but you're going to wait. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a great time for you to develop your faith and your spiritual muscles and wait patiently. That's a moment for you to be developed is you're, you know, you're in traffic and you want to get to a place and now there's this accident and it's going to take 10, 15 minutes. You've got a choice. And if you choose to wait patiently and be, just begin to worship the Lord or listen to my CD, <laughs> ha, 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 whatever, you know, and keep your faith active during that time, that's patience. But so many people, when a test or trial comes, they disengage their faith and they think, well, patience... Patience means to put up with, and it doesn't. So keeping faith active while waiting for due season is patience. Once again, if you don't keep your faith active, you will not be ready when due season comes. Hallelujah. When your due season arrives, I'm going to tell you how you will know. When your due season arrives, God will speak to you. And he will say to you something like this. It's your time. It's your time. Or he'll say, due season is here. But you'll have a knowing in your heart that yesterday was one season. You woke up today and the Spirit of God spoke to you and today you've entered into a new season. God will always let you know when you've entered into a new season. He is faithful he is just, and it would be very unfair for him not to let you know when you've changed seasons. So he will tell you, it's, it's your time. And immediately, you will start getting instructions from the Holy Spirit on what you need to do and what you need to say. The Holy Spirit will always give you instructions when you step into a new season. Something else that always happens when you enter into a new season is that God brings new people into your life. 
He will always bring new people into your life. He'll bring you to a new place, a new situation, because the old people, nothing wrong with them, but they know you in this season, and when it's time for you to change people, go, no, no, stay back over here with us. Stay over here with us. It's not, what, what are you thinking? What are you doing? What are you doing going over to that small church in that funeral home? Are you crazy? What's up with that? When your season change, God brings new people in your life because they have revelation that God is going to use to help you in your new season. Mm, mm, mm. Thank you, Lord. Let's go, please, to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. And when you get to Galatians 6, 9, hold your place and go to Hebrews 12, 3. We will read these back to back. We'll read Galatians 6, 9 first. And then we will read Hebrews 12 and 3. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3. And let, this is Galatians 6, 9, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. I want us to read that one more time. I want you just to hang on every word of this verse, please. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And then Hebrews 12, 3. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Where does fainting start? It's right in your mind. You're right. It starts in your mind. You may want to write this down. Weariness starts with entertaining wrong thoughts. Weariness starts with entertaining wrong thoughts. Weariness starts with entertaining wrong thoughts. Feigning starts in our mind. How does this work? How is this? Because we get to looking by sight and we forget to walk by faith. When you get your eyes off of, the, off of your receipts, get your eyes off of the Lord and begin to look at the circumstance and begin to look at the calendar and how much time has gone by, begin to look at, at sight and how you feel and how it looks, those thoughts, you begin to entertain them, you start to get weary. Break. This is a break time here. Let's just be real. Let's be honest for a second. How many of you know that in all reality, we should never be discouraged because of our master Jesus. In all reality, Jesus is it. He is the one, he's our king, he is our hero, he's our conqueror. All that he's done, he's done for us. He's living on the inside of us. We have a bright future. No Christian should really ever be discouraged. That's the truth. But we know from life and from the things that have happened to us, many times we've experienced that, and the devil wants that temptation to come to us. He wants us to get weary and quit. And so we have to fight the good fight of faith, right? Weariness starts with entertaining wrong thoughts. Many believers fail in this, especially when they get to comparing their experience to that of other Christians. <laughs> Many believers fail in this, especially when they get to comparing their experience to that of other Christians. I'll say that a few more times. It's a long sentence. 
Many believers fail in this, especially when they get to comparing their experience to that of other Christians. Many believers fail in this, especially when they get to comparing their experience to that of other Christians. We need to take the testimonies and the wonderful stories that we hear and use them as an encouragement for our faith. But what we do is we begin to compare. Well, Lord, you bless so-and-so like such-and-such. How come you won't bless me that way? And that comparison gets us to grow weary. Because, Lord, I'm believing for that same car. And they drove up in the church parking lot with that, I mean, the same model, the same color, and they come in smiling and it's paid for. They've been in the things of God for six months. I've been in this 30 years and I'm driving that old piece of trash out there. What is going on? And we begin to compare experiences and we begin to get weary. We need to take those testimonies, those good stories, and encourage ourselves. But then what we need to do is get our eyes off of that and keep it real simple. And here's how you do it. It is written. It is written. Just keep it simple. It is written. And don't compare yourself with other people. What God has for you is going to come probably a different way. And the problem with comparison is twofold. One is you can compare yourself with somebody that's lower on the totem pole and you get full of pride. I am the man. I walk on water. I am the man. Or you get to looking at somebody who's higher on the totem pole and you think, yeah, man, I'm not even sure Jesus really loves me. I'm probably a stepchild in the kingdom of God. So we cannot afford to compare ourselves, Right? That is dangerous. When we ask, why is it taking so long? Have you ever asked that question? Let's raise both of our hands. Why is it taking so long? I have for you a solid answer. Someone says, praise God. I have for you a, this is not a light answer. This is a real solid answer as to why it takes so long. You ready? For more information, please contact this ministry at P.O. Box. Uh, okay, here we go. When we ask why is it taking so long, we need to keep in mind that as we begin to pray and believe God for certain things in our lives, often the things for which we are asking will directly and indirectly affect other believers as well. I know it's a lot. When we, uh, here's what we need to keep in mind. When we begin to pray, believe for certain things in our lives, often the things for which we are asking will directly and indirectly affect other believers as well. Often the things for which we are asking will directly and indirectly affect other believers as well. Can you say amen and write at the same time? <laughs> Often the things for which we are asking will directly and indirectly affect other believers as well. How many of you know we're a body? We are a body. We are the body of Christ. And what we do affects other members. And what, what God does in our life affects other people. I remember years ago, one of, the, one of the first times God began to just begin to talk to me about some of these things. I was praying about who I am in Christ and my rights in the Lord. And I was in a car. I was driving down Madison Avenue in Granite City. And I came up to a stoplight, four-way stoplight. So there's, there's cars and then there's me. And I'm waiting at the stoplight, and then the light turns uh, green. And just before I put my foot on the gas pedal, one of the cars whoosh, right in front of me. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, the green light means that you had the right to go. 
But in your patience, you had to wait for somebody to do something else first. If I had demanded my way, I would have had a crash. I would have had a wreck. And many times in the body of Christ, we demand our way. And what we do is we wind up crashing into somebody else. We need to, we need to claim our rights in our prayer time with the Lord. But we need to allow the Lord to lift us up, to promote us. Because he knows where everybody's at and what's going on in their lives. The wheels are turning. I'll let the Holy Spirit deal with you about that. Let me get real plain. All of us in this room have come from another church. Our church is. When you left, that affected other people. It affected that pastor. It affected that church, that congregation. And now it's Probably someone's not sitting in that spot anymore. And you're here. You're leaving. You're transferring affected other people. And there are other people that are going to be coming in here from other places. And God is repositioning things so when they leave, it will wind up being a blessing and not a curse. To, to the best that he can do and keep, keep, help keep people's, people's attitudes and hearts right and pure. You must not let the seeming lack of results cause you to grow weary. You must not let the, let the seeming lack of results cause you to grow weary. And I want to give you a key word that will really help you if you are in a season that you really don't maybe necessarily enjoy and your heart's longing for a different season and you know God's preparing you for what we call due season, let me give you one word that will really encourage you and help you to keep you steady. And that word is the word appointed. Appointed. Let's go, please, to the book of Job 23. The word appointed. Job 23 and 14. Everybody say appointed. appointed. Amen. Appointed. Job 23, 14. Job chapter 23, verse 14. This is a verse God gave me back in 2012. I've spent some time with this verse. It's alive in me. I love it. <laughs> Let me, the, the Lord just gave this to me. This is an interesting application. I had someone call and they were going to do some marriage counseling. And uh, so part of the deal was that the husband was trying to fix his wife. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I said, well, that's dumb. I said, that's just dumb. And, and so this person said, well, why? I said, because he can't even fix himself. Why would he try to fix his spouse? And, he, and, he just, and he, we're talking on the phone, but I could hear the revelation. He goes, oh, yeah, you know. Apart from God, you can't even change you. Right? It takes the grace and the mercy of God, His truth, His Spirit working in you to change you. So what position are we in to try to fix and change somebody else? Yeah, you can't. No wonder why she was frustrated. And he was too. Job 23, 14. For he performeth the thing. Now, i got to say this. But if he loves her, he will pray for her. And he'll pray for himself. Right? Because right. only the Holy Ghost can fix us. Yes. Job 23, 14. For he performeth the thing that is appointed for me. And many such things are with him. For he performeth the thing. Can you perform it? Yeah. Hmm. Can you change your season? No. no. He performeth the thing that is appointed for me. God has appointed it. 
That's why he revealed it to you in the first place. Oh, did you get that? God has appointed it. That's why he revealed it to you in the first place. The whole reason why God revealed to you what he has for you is because he has appointed that for you and he himself is going to enjoy performing it. He has appointed a due season for all of us. Where the promises of God are concerned, it's not a matter of if, but when. Right? Where the promises of God are concerned, it's not a matter of if, but when, because God has appointed it, and he will perform it. But I'm not seeing any progress, Phil. I'm not seeing any progress. We need to realize that progress is being made in the spiritual realm. Every day of your life, spiritual progress is being made. That's why the devil wants you, once again, to throw in the towel, to quit, to give up. He puts pressure on you to look at the natural. And if you look at the natural, you're going to be discouraged. You have to realize process is being made in the spiritual realm. A lot can be happening beneath the surface that you never perceive if you're going by what you see. I think of Leanne has a, a garden and so she, you know, has this nice garden. She planted the seeds. And Leanne loves to garden. She's just a gardener. And she went and bought a, f- a lot of flowers to pr- pretty up the yard. And so, you know, I'm out there with the tiller a couple months ago. We till up the, the, the garden. And so she gets the seed. She plants it in the ground. She's so excited, you know. And so every couple of days she's looking out there to see, you know. <laughs> and so yesterday she goes, man, look at my garden, Phil. Look at my garden. Man, it's greening up real good. Well, how many of you know that there's a whole lot of stuff that happens underneath the ground before it comes up. And there's a whole lot of stuff that happens in the spiritual realm that has to grow and develop before it happens in the natural. Ooh, thank you, Lord. I got a fresh word for somebody. Here it is. The Lord says, if you want it right now, I can do it right now. But it won't have a root system in the spirit and the devil will be able to snatch it and take it away. But if you wait and let it develop some root in the spiritual realm, when you have manifestation and it's in your hands, the devil won't be able to steal it because it's rooted in the spirit realm. And that way you got it forever. Come on, say it with me. Progress is being made. Because God has appointed it. Amen. Leviticus, please. Leviticus 26. Here's something new the Lord gave me also concerning seasons. I had totally missed this last time I was studying and teaching on seasons. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus 26. So we need to understand due season... Living by faith, right? Leviticus 26 and 4. So simple. I read this. Then I will give you rain in due season. And the land shall yield her increase. And the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. That's a good verse. Amen? When something is given out of season, it's destructive. When something is given out of season, it's destructive. Rain coming in season is a good thing. Man, it makes things green up and grow and it's wonderful. But rain in the wrong season is destructive. And so we need to understand due season. It's appointed. It's happening Progress is being made, but you don't want it premature because the very thing you want will destroy you if given to you out of season. Oh, our flesh wants it yesterday, doesn't it? When something is given out of season, it's destructive. When something is given in season, it's beautiful, edifying, and completing. When something is given in season, it's beautiful, 
edifying and completing. I call it the ah factor. There's just a completion in your spirit when something's given in due season to you. Hallelujah. Read with me, please, in the book of Psalm 31. Psalm 31. We're almost finished with point eight. Point nine won't take near as long. I'm so thankful that God is revealing to us seasons, and yet at the same time we can live by faith because faith is now. It's not contradictory. If we think scriptures are contradictory, we haven't found the third scripture that ties it together. Psalm 31. Psalm 31. Verse 14 and 15. You enjoying this? Yes. Yeah? Good. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord, for being good to us. Psalm 31, 14. But I trusted in thee, O Lord. I said, thou art my God. My times are in thy hand. My times are in thy hand. Deliver me from the hand of mine enemies and from them that persecute me. Develop a trust in God's timing. Use scriptures like this in the scripture in Job and develop a trust in God's timing. He loves you and he has your best interest in mind and in his heart. God desires the very best for us, brothers and sisters. He's a good father. We sing that song, he, you know, he, you're a good, good father. He is. And we need to know that our times and our seasons are in his hands. Think about this. That's the best place. You don't want your times in somebody else's hands. You don't even want them in your hands. You want them in the master's hands. Your times are in his hand. Trust his timing. God is not slack concerning his promises. 2 Peter 3, 9 tells us, God is not slack concerning his promises. We need to pray. Lift up your hands and say, Father, Father I, trust I trust you with my times, with my times and my seasons. And my you will, perform you will perform that which is appointed for me, that which is appointed for me. And, many and many such things are with you. Are with you. I, repent I repent for not enjoying my seasons, for, not enjoying my seasons. <laughs> for being anxious about my seasons. About my seasons. I, trust I trust you. Thank you, Lord, Thank you, Lord that my times, my times are in your hands. In your hands. Amen. 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 Now, before we go to the final component or element that makes up faith, let's remind ourselves of the five spiritual evergreens. Remember? Yeah, she, here she goes on this because she's been studying. She's ready for Tuesday night. There are five spiritual evergreens. These are things that we do not have to wait for. These are things that we should not be waiting for because they are evergreen. What's an evergreen? Always green. Always green. It doesn't matter what season it is, it's evergreen. God has given us some evergreens while we're waiting for due season to come. So here they are. Number one, salvation slash forgiveness. No one has to wait to get saved and you don't have to wait for God to get in a good mood to forgive you of your sins. Salvation and forgiveness of sins is always an evergreen. It's always in season. Number two, healing. Healing is an evergreen. There's not a set day or time for you to be healed. And I know there's a whole lot of teaching in the church right now about, yeah, God heals, but you've got to wait for such and such a time. You've got to wait till you get to that meeting. You've got to wait till a certain time. And that's what they taught during Jesus' day. Well, let him come on the Sabbath day to be healed. You can't get healed Monday through Saturday, but on Sunday, that's healing day. That's religion. Jesus healed people on the Sabbath day, not just to make them mad, <laughs> but to prove a, a spiritual truth that healing is an evergreen. It's always in season. There's no set time for you to be healed. 
Healing is an evergreen. Number three, freedom from sinful habits. Freedom from sinful habits. Praise God, we don't have to sin. Praise God, we don't have to be messed up on some kind of uh, habit that's going to hurt us or our family. Any kind of bondage in our life, today is the day of salvation. It's the day of freedom and deliverance. Glory to God. We don't have to wait for that. And last week we confessed about being free. What a good confession that is. Number four, your needs being met. Your needs being met is an evergreen. Now, that's not prosperity. That's not where you're flowing in lots and lots of money and you're supporting projects around the world. Your needs being met is God's will for you today. You shouldn't be struggling financially. Now, if you took your money and you went to Sears and you bought that new chainsaw and didn't pay your water bill, you've got an issue. That goes back to freedom from sinful habits. <laughs> Right? But all things being equal, you being good, your needs being met. And number five, being filled with the Spirit is an evergreen. Being filled with the Spirit, speaking in tongues, that's God's will for every Christian right now. There's not a set day or time for you to be filled with the Holy Ghost and pray in other tongues. Notice that all five of these spiritual evergreens have something in common, and that's that's why these are evergreens. This is really a big deal. This is what helped me in Lord just giving me understanding between spiritual evergreens and what's seasonal. Here's the difference. These five evergreens have this thing in common. They are between you and the Lord. No third party is necessary. No third party is necessary in spiritual evergreens. Now God can use a third party, but he doesn't have to. In things that are seasonal, third party, fourth party, fifth party is required. I made a statement a couple weeks ago, and the Lord said, you need to deal with this. I made the statement that there are some things, no matter how much faith you have, you're going to have to wait for. I need to explain what I mean by that. You all know my story. Saved at five, called to preach at eight, preached my first sermon at 12. I remember at 12, standing up behind the pulpit, 325 people, and I'm standing there. I have it on, I have it recorded. You ought to hear it. If you ever get depressed, I'll call, call me and I'll let you listen to it. You'll be happy in about 10 minutes, all right? Funny as can be. One of my first. But anyway, I'm, so I'm standing there behind the pulpit, you know, doing my first sermon. Well, in my heart, I'm ready to pastor. <laughs> so I think. How many of you know a 12-year-old's not ready to pastor? No matter how much faith he has in his heart, he's going to have to go through some seasons and mature, right? right. So it, there are some things, it doesn't matter how much faith you have, you're going to have to go through some seasons, that seasons and let God prepare you and mold you and shape you into the person you need to be because other people's lives are going to be involved. So I wanted to clarify that statement. So all these, these five here, between you and the Lord... Things that are seasonal is going to be and going to affect other people. Number nine, the ninth element of how to live by faith is expectation. Expectation. We're coming down to our home stretch here. Proverbs 24, please. A term that we don't hear too much anymore that I always liked. Uh, somebody would be talking about somebody else and they would say, you know, that's a seasoned man. He's a seasoned person. He, she's a seasoned lady. What does that mean? It means they've been through some seasons. They've matured. They've developed. It doesn't mean somebody put some salt and pepper on top of them. <laughs> they've been through, they're a seasoned individual. Proverbs 24 and 13. Uh, hallelujah. I, I guess that's not it. Thank you. Yes, well, let's read 13 and 14. 
My son, eat thou honey, because it is good, and the honeycomb which is sweet to thy taste. So shall the knowledge of wisdom be unto thy soul, when thou hast found it. Then there shall be a reward, and thy expectation shall not be cut off. And then Proverbs 23, 18. This is one of my favorites in this area. Proverbs 23, 18. For surely there is an end, and thine expectation shall not be cut off. That is a good verse. For surely there is an end, and thine expectation shall not be cut off. Would you do me a favor and read that out loud with me, please? For surely there is an end, and thine expectation shall not be cut off. Expectation is a very powerful thing. Once again, you may want to write this down. Expectation. It colors your outlook, shapes your attitudes, and influences your actions. Expectation. It colors your outlook, shapes your attitudes, and influences your actions. You know what I'm thinking of right now? That this is right the opposite of growing weary and fainting in your mind? Expectation. It colors your outlook, shapes your attitudes, and influences your actions. To expect is to anticipate. When you are expecting, you're looking for something to happen and you are preparing for it. To expect is to anticipate. When you are expecting, you're looking for something and you are preparing for it. Uh, How about a woman that's pregnant? And we say she is expecting. So what would we think if a woman came in and, and she's with child and she's about six months along and so we're talking to her. So you're expecting? Yeah, yeah, I'm expecting. Well, what are you doing? Well, what do you mean? Well, are, like, are you preparing, getting some things decorated? No. You're not? No. You're not getting a crib? No. A bassinet? No. <laughs> Going to paint a room, clean it up? No. We would, we would think something's wrong because we, we are expecting her to start preparing because in three months, something's coming down the pike, yeah. right? When you're biblically expecting, you are preparing for that thing to happen in your life. True Bible expectation implies preparation. You're preparing for that thing to happen. Expectation implies preparation. Preparation speaks really loud to God. It, it, it just speaks a lot to him, and it reveals to him that we're, that we're ready to receive. If you're preparing, God is watching that, and he goes, look at that. Look at, look at you. Look at my daughter. Man, she is so expecting that healing. She is preparing for it. She just bought her some plane tickets to go to Hawaii because she's fully expecting for that healing to manifest. That speaks a lot to God. And then when I teach on the healing, I tell people that one of the main reasons why people don't receive their healing is they don't prepare to be healed. It's just a, a scatter shot. If it sticks, fine. If it doesn't, that's okay too. But people fail to receive healing because they don't prepare to be healed. If you're expecting, you're preparing. Amen? Amen. If you really want to receive everything God has provided for you, you must begin to cultivate expectancy. Now, I, I've been doing some study uh, off and on from different sources, and God kind of weaves some things together for me that I didn't, didn't realize was going to come. I found this statement made by Oral Roberts, Benny Hinn, uh, Lester Summerall, uh, Smith Wigglesworth, several notable ministers that have large ministries, healing ministries, miracle ministries, They've all made this statement, and it caused me to raise the eyebrow. And this is what they said. A high level of expectancy 
is almost always a prerequisite for a miracle. A high level of expectancy is almost always a prerequisite for a miracle. A high level of expectancy is almost always a prerequisite for a miracle. Brother Hagen, uh, before he went home to be with the Lord, said one of his books that in one of his eight visitations from the Lord, the Lord said to him, if my people would just begin to expect, I would move upon the, that expectancy. He said, but my people come to church and they're not expecting anything. He said, if my people would just begin to expect, I could move on that. A high level of expectancy is almost always a prerequisite for a miracle. The truth is that God blesses ex expectant people. Our last verse, brothers and sisters, is Psalm 62 and 5. Psalm 62 and 5. Do you have it? Okay. My soul wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. If you are only looking to God, then you have no need to put pressure on people. If your expectancy is only from God, it frees you up to be nice. <laughs> God gave me that the other day. It frees you up to be nice because you're not a heavy. You're not going around looking to people to meet your need. Your expectancy is from him only. And so it frees you up to be nice. Did you know the Bible tells us in the book of 2 Peter chapter 1 that there are some things that we need to add to our faith and one of them is brotherly kindness. We need to be nice to people. We, we are Christians. We need to be nice. We need to be kind to people. And if we're expecting from God, then we're free to be nice. No pressure on people whatsoever. Brothers and sisters, we only have one source. We have many channels, many avenues, but we all have only one source, and that's God. Amen. And so there's no need to put pressure on others. Our expectancy should be from him. Amen? Amen? All right. How to live by faith. These are the nine components, the nine elements. This is how we do it. Here's how we live by faith. Number one, a quality decision. Number two, find your receipt. Number three, hear the word. Number four, meditate the word. Number five, confess the word. Number six, do the word. Number seven, apply the pressure of patience. Num number eight, understand due season. And number nine, expectation. This is how we live. This is the lifestyle that pleases God. Amen. Thank you so much for listening to this message and being a part of the voice of faith. Until next time we gather around the good word of God, remember these words, be not afraid, only believe.